All right, welcome to everybody who is joining in on a uh, late night panel, I should say, 9.30 p.m. Eastern here, where I am in New York City. I'm Akiko Fujita, a reporter and anchor with Yahoo Finance. Very excited to be able to uh, be hosting this panel, Trust in Resilience, Navigating Business in a World on the Edge. And I think it's clear to say everybody has been a bit on the edge over the last year. But as we look ahead to things slowly opening up uh, with the vaccines rolling out. Uh, we kind of want to use this panel to talk about the lessons we have learned from the pandemic and, and what that's likely to mean for a post-pandemic world, specifically focusing on the geopolitical risks, but also how business, the business landscape has shifted as well. And we've got a, a very diverse panel to discuss this topic. Uh, Pallavi Aliwali is a managing attorney at Aliwali Law Offices. We've got Jagdish Dalal, the president of J. Dalal Associates. Francis Govers, uh, autonomy lead at Bell Helicopter. Girish Ramachandran, he's president of Asia Pacific of Tata Consulting Services. Girish the lone one joining us from Singapore today. And then uh, we've got Anna Tunkel, who is head of global strategic initiatives and partnerships at APCO Worldwide. And Anna, I wanna get right into it with you. Uh, by looking back on how COVID-19 has really exposed the broader societal vulnerabilities, there's been a lot of talk of just how much of the issues we're discussing today were already in place, but really accelerated by the pandemic itself. So as you look at what this has meant for our APCO, but also from a, a global business perspective. How are you assessing the last year? Thanks, Akiko. And so nice to be with you and uh, with such a great panel uh, on this late evening. Um, um, so as you mentioned, I work for a company called APCO Worldwide. And just for, for context, we're um, a global advisory firm that is uh, present across 34 markets that's working probably more than 60 through our clients and we work at the intersection of advisory public affairs and communications and touching uh, many businesses, large and small in different parts of the world over the past year. Um, and from where I sit in New York, but with a global view, um, there are indeed a number of trends that, um, and, and you know, probably down, downward trends that uh, COVID uh, has exposed and, and exacerbated. I think looking broadly, um, the social safety net and um, uh, in the United States, I think um, we had uh, probably seen most pressure on it and uh, this you know, past year has really shown to us how countries with strong and established safety nets fare vis-a-vis -vis others. Uh, I think we're looking at uh, an Asia-led recovery, you know, potentially for, for a reason. And uh, in the United States, um, this probably broader weaknesses that uh, resulted in uh, implications in the healthcare system in mass unemployment. already on the in more vulnerable positions. I think the UN estimates that COVID um, exacerbated progress on uh, sustainable development goals. And as we look at um, the 17 SDGs, it's likely that that progress has been set back by, by at least a decade. Um, 71 million people have been pushed to extreme poverty. Um, unemployment in the informal sector, which is so prevalent across emerging and developing countries, um, pushed around million, 1.6 billion um, um, to, to positions of extreme vulnerability, given how much um, is dependent um, on the informal economy networks. Um, and um, given that we at Africa were a majority women-owned firm, and um, obviously uh, that lens is incredibly true to me and, 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 to, and to where we look at this from, from where I sit, um, looking at how much women have been disproportionately hit by leaving the workforce um, in the U.S. alone, um, unemployment 
uh, across the, the unemployment rate for adult women has risen from 3% to 15% in February alone. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there, there's, it's been dubbed the, not the recession, but the she session. Because yeah. it, in comparison to the 2008 crisis that predominantly pushed men in the financial sector um, to, to the unemployment uh, ranks, uh, today women are really at the center. One yeah. uh, final point to mention is um, this emergence of a class rift between the work from homes and those who do not have that privilege. Um, and that is much deeply rooted in uh, digital gaps and, uh, and, and education and skills that I think the pandemic has really uh, pulled the curtain uh, from, from in front of a lot of us in terms of what those inequalities might look like for, for the decades ahead. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a, a lot in terms of sort of these these fragmentations or fractures, if you want to call it that, that have really been exposed during the pandemic. Um, I just want to remind um, some of those who are joining in on the panel, but we're going to try to get to some questions as well. So if you want to put them in the chat, we'll try to maybe get it to it a little later in the session. Going back to what Anna said, though, um, I wonder if we can sort of break this down between domestic and then international, because I think a lot of the things that you hit on, especially about the the impact socially here, the inequality among communities of color, but also uh, the inequality in gender, uh, that is something that has really been exposed in the pandemic. Uh, Pallavi, I wonder if that's something that you can speak to here in terms of how you have seen the vulnerabilities really open up um, and, and, and how do you address it when you think, on the one hand, people keep talking about this K-shaped recovery. You've got companies who are looking forward and saying there's pent-up demand. Uh, things are really going to spike from here. And then you've got a whole other part of the population that is still struggling um, to get back on their feet. Yes. I mean, uh, it's so true that they are. Uh, I think from uh, the experiences around, and we've had uh, uh, lots of data that was released uh, over time that showed uh, that a bunch of businesses that closed, uh, and these were a lot of the essential, the restaurants, you know, the, the crucial workers that were going into work that couldn't make it there. Uh, uh, about 60% of those closures were going to be permanent. So, uh, and we also learned uh, over time that a lot of the ones that were impacted uh, to Anna's point and I've lost uh, connection, I apologize for a little bit in the middle, um, that uh, a lot of the people that were uh, impacted were women and they, they will uh, continue with that impact. We're also, I mean, I think when we're here, we can also look at that we're going to be walking away with a bunch of lessons. I don't think we can take away the gender inequality from uh, this learning. I don't know how we would make a shift from that. But definitely, uh, you know, uh, how businesses can pivot, how they can learn to collaborate with customers and their own employees. Uh, and I would say one thing that would help a lot of businesses and uh, come up with new ways would be flexibility. Right. And I think that would be key to what we're seeing uh, that has um, uh, brought, brought a lot of people uh, to stay back home and not be able to uh, go into the workforce. But then again, it also depends on the nature of businesses. So I think there has to be some kind of a plan that comes up that would uh, um, anticipate not only a pandemic like that, but other uh, forces that would interfere with the running of businesses and to be able to maybe come up with a handbook that would help people uh, eventually uh, navigate this. So we'll get to some of the solutions in just a bit, but um, you know, given that the, the, the title of this panel is about the, a world on edge, Jagdisha, I wonder if you can speak to um, sort of what Anna touched on here, which is the difference in the government responses we have seen in the pandemic and what that has meant from a recovery standpoint. Certainly a lot of businesses looking at this, Asian countries, China specifically, took a much more hardline approach early on, uh, but all the latest data points to a much quicker bounce back because they did gain control of the virus. What does that mean from a geopolitical standpoint? If we're talking about a post COVID world or at least a world in which the virus is controlled. 
in a much more contained state than it is now. I think that's a good point. That the, what I really want to bring up is we're talking about a global implication. It's not just a pandemic. We're talking about a global or climate warming. We're getting issues where different governments have a different approach. We're going to have to get to a point at some time in the future where we can kind of look at a sort of a coordinated of effort across the globe, or else we're not going to be able to address and be resilient against these things happening. A pandemic is going to happen again, unless we really make sure that the entire world is on the same page. Same thing is going to happen with the global warming. We're going to have the storms. We're going to have the issues happening unless the, all of the countries and all of the participants then identify and take their own step. At the end of the day, I think that we've got two, three, four different things that I call right now as disruptive to the businesses. And the resilience is the right word. If businesses don't succeed, they're resilient and know how to change. Because this is going to happen again. And and a lot of corporations, and as Pallavi mentioned, that, that they have to change. You know, there's a restaurant, whether it's a uh, retail, whether it's a wholesale, we're going to have to figure out a way of how globally we can work with each other and create an opportunity to really address the challenge that faces all of us. I mean, there are issues right now with the chip shortages. Mm -hmm. and, and as a result, we're having to really fall back on some technological development that can help us in this process. So it is a global issue. It is an issue where all of the government and political parties have to come together and say, we have a common issue. I mean, having said that, I wonder if, if you look at, for example, just what's happening with the vaccine distribution, the nationalism we're seeing on that front with, for example, even within the EU countries saying we're not going to send it to the UK, for example, because uh, they have not owned up to their agreement. The US is being accused of hoarding all the vaccinations as well. I mean, Jagdish, just to follow on your point, what does that say about uh, how much hope or optimism there is in this collective effort to respond, not just to the pandemic, but also to the global economic recovery. And, and that's the bottom line. I think we have to think in terms of global challenge, not local challenge. And I think today, all the political organizations have looked at it as a local challenge. WHO has been made totally powerless in all of this. If there was an evidence we bet that they could have taken a lead and organizations and countries given them the rights to participate, we could have had a slightly different response probably earlier. But that, that hasn't happened. And, and, and it's across the board that the political boundaries have stopped, communication have stopped sharing of information, have stopped saying that we first and, and that's going to cause future challenges that's going to be harder to overcome. Yeah, I mean, especially as you point to the fact that, that climate change is sort of that next big crisis or one that's already, uh, some would argue, already unfolding. Um, Francis, I feel like Jagdish's reference to the chip shortage was kind of an opening to bring you into the conversation because you have had to manage all of the bottlenecks in the supply chain throughout all of this. We know early on in the pandemic, it was about borders shutting down, uh, companies trying to manage where to get their products and components from. What does the supply chain look like for you right now specifically? Yeah, and certainly uh, uh, we work in, uh, we're in 60 countries. Um, uh, we are uh, have a major, my particular group, uh, man we're managing the project that's in Canada. Uh, our joint U.S. Canadian projects. We have offices in China and all over Europe. So, uh, the, yeah, the first thing that happened was the chip shortage. You know, we were trying to get parts from from China. We were not able to. Uh, we were trying to get part uh, machine parts from from uh, Europe and struggling with that. So it, it um, put a put a dent in things pretty quickly. But we also kind of developed a patient attitude. 
and uh, work through the problems rather than letting them be a source of frustration. Uh, honestly, uh, we've been able, particularly with the Canadian group, well, I have a Canadian group, I have an Indian group in my department. And with the Canadian group, uh, we started doing these Zoom calls and we started getting to know each other individually and their people's pets and their children. And we met their, you know, aunts and uncles. And so, um, it, honestly, there were some very positive. I, I think the, we're going to see that continue in, into the future. As, as I was just counting, this is my 12th Zoom call today. Um, but uh, uh, I do appreciate that we've, it's also, while it's created problems, it's also created opportunities. And the process of getting over those has, has led us to um, uh, think more heavily about these international relationships and how we're dependent on them. And, uh, and I guess develop a bit more empathy for, you know, you talked about, you know, there's been, yes, there very definitely has been a me first kind of international flavor for this, but there's also been in other areas, a, a, um, a joint, we're all in this together. You know, mm -hmm. this affected everybody all around the world. It affected India, it affected Singapore, it affected Europe and, and Africa, and, um, and we're all dealing with it. And so we do have a lot of sympathy for each other because we've all been stuck in this together. Um, strictly, from a, strictly from an operational yeah. standpoint, though, I mean, I imagine there's only so much you can do on Zoom because you have to actually yeah, yeah. go out and, and manufacture. Yeah, yeah. If you're talking about yeah. Bell Helicopters, um, now that yeah. you, you see what could potentially happen in a crisis like this pandemic when borders shut down, are you thinking about, are there internal conversations about bringing production closer to home? Uh, it seems like we've heard that increasingly from a lot of major companies. Yeah, we've certainly looked at it. That's not a minor consideration. Uh, uh, we are very much a U.S. Canadian company. I mean, as far as our manufacturing is concerned, our, we have major plants. We do all of our, our civil production in Canada. So it's it's not something we can undo. You know, we've been doing this for 50 years. It's not something we're gonna undo tomorrow. And no, we, we didn't really consider that. I can't say it caused me personally a lot of problems. We had to cancel an entire test program. We're now a year behind where we want it to be. Uh, but, uh, you know, well, we will we will get through it, and we're looking forward to the borders opening and getting you know getting being able to travel back to Canada again and back to Europe and back to the other countries that we we work in. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, there's no doubt that it hurt us, but it's also, it, you know, I I don't know. It's it's we worked through it. We got on, we got on with it, <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, we're going to have to figure out in the future how to re how to deal with these sort of things. We are very, very, um, it does kind of focus our attention on the people that work for our company uh, and they're worrying about them as individuals a little more than we did before. Um, I particularly worry about our factory folks, the folks that cannot stay home, uh, mm -hmm. that have to come in. And, um, you know, we really took a lot of care that those people were were you know, respected and and taken care of. We were fortunate in that uh, social distancing is is not difficult <laughs> in our mm -hmm. environment. But we could have been in another kind of place where there was a lot of close contact. That would have been a serious problem. Um, but uh, we're honestly, I, I think, as as at least as a social organization, as compared to the the financial organization, coming out of this a bit stronger than we went into it. But that I, we may be the exception in that. I've seen other companies where that was definitely not the case. And certainly if we were a restaurant or a um, retail business, we would be in very, very serious problems. Yeah. Um, and we've, we've tried even locally, you know, trying to support our local, local small companies and our local small restaurants and order out and things. But anyway, um, uh I say it's it's been a challenge, but we yeah. at least in our in our group we rose to the challenge. I was very very pleased with our, our management's forward looking. You know, they took immediate action uh, drastically, and then uh, and they've held to that line and still hold to that line. We're still doing the same stuff we've been doing until things calm down. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, it's been a nice place to work in the middle of this. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I know a lot of other folks can't say that, but at least for our group, uh, we can say that the management took proactive steps. It worked. We, we got, we were able to be productive and continue in, in the midst of the crisis. Girish, I want to bring you into the conversation because you are joining us from Singapore in many ways, um, the Asia Pacific region, a step ahead of us here in the U S because, uh, governments were able to contain the virus, uh, much more quickly. Um, you didn't see the kind of outbreaks we've been seeing in the U S where do things stand? And, and as you assess, the business landscape. What do you think has been the most fundamental shift that businesses have had to adapt? And uh, if I look at it from a from a political landscape, I can see organizations moving towards or countries moving a lot towards nationalism and uh, self-reliance. Okay. You may you may call it uh, either way. Um, and the second one is on focusing purely on technology leadership. Uh, that's what we are seeing between US and China. And uh, also furthering either international cooperation or, or competition, okay. depending on which side of, of which side you are taking. Okay. So we, have, we are also seeing um, uh, huge shifts, especially in Asia, on uh, traditional supply chains. And uh, those supply chains are going to be uh, disrupted forever. And we also talked about the economic um, um, inequality, which is which is actually exasperated exas- during this particular case uh, because of uh, healthcare as well as uh, education. If you put this in context of business, what probably we all should realize is that before COVID is when we had the industrial revolution 4.0, which has started. Mm-hmm. That along with uh, COVID is actually um, what we what we probably see is that we are seeing a um, uh, pace of change, which is going to be constant and continuous. Okay. And uh, if I look at it from my vantage point, no, I'll give you a few things uh, which I see um, uh, from a from a from a TCS lens. We were around we are mm-hmm. around half in employees in TCS, okay? And uh, we worked uh, from, a, from an employee point of view, we were working uh, and most of our employees happened to be in Asia, okay? okay. Now, um, if I look at it, we were working at a model where 96% of our workforce were working in offices, okay? And overnight, we had to shift today and today we are mm-hmm. 90 Seven percent of our workforce today is working from home, the safety of home, okay? which is a huge shift, okay? which brings in a whole lot of um, changes. Even and, and we realize that this is going to be the future. Okay? So we have actually have a point out there. We call it 25 by 25. We believe that we will only need 25 percent of our workforce to come to office at any given point in time by 20. Mm-hmm. And we are pivoting to a different model which brings in a whole lot of difference and in terms of leadership uh, in the business side. How do you manage people through this particular crisis and what have we learned through that? So a whole lot of things. And if I look at uh, uh, some of the issues uh, around the world, I believe uh, uh, digitization can solve a lot of the issues. Mm-hmm. Digitization might not have a lot of answers to some of the solu- to some of the problems as well. Okay? Like, for example... Yeah. We were talking about um, we were talking about education. Okay. I mean, I don't think you know Zoom calls or any of that is going to I mean, uh, completely redefine education. Education is going to be a place where you still need to get that collaboration with, with your teacher and students. Okay. So there are places where technology can help. There are places where technology will not be able to help as well. Mm-hmm. Um, going back to what you said about the the twenty five by twenty five, the the twenty five percent. Uh, that's a figure that that we've heard a number of companies refer to. Is that the the transition into a hundred percent, or is that a permanent number? You think that hybrid that's going to stay? Uh, it, again, from our from our model, we believe that collaboration is what is what is very important in a in a tech world. So we, I mean, what has what happened before the crisis was that there is a lot of adoption of agile. Uh, into into businesses, okay? and agile by itself means that 
you need to get people coming together to collaborate and try to create a solution okay now um, we believe that uh, even if you are doing agile we don't we can do it from a location independent model but you still need people to come together to uh, to essentially uh, come up with new ideas okay? and for that we strongly believe that we will still need people to come to our offices maybe one day a week mm-hmm. or two days a week depending on what what type of team you are in okay? so it is uh, we don't think it's going to be a 100% remote model we believe mm-hmm. that it, it has to be a model where uh, people will have to come together maybe not to office maybe they will all get together uh, in the airbnb office somewhere okay you know if if you if you look at it, what the future model might look like and and uh, the, it 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 could essentially be something like that but we still think that for cross collaboration we need people to get together so i wonder if we can move the conversation forward on on the resilience part of all of this we've sort of established right. that this shift that has happened you know what does that mean for how businesses operate moving forward and anna i want to bring you back into that palavi mentioned something interesting earlier where she said there needs to be this handbook essentially um as as things sort of go to this new normal i mean you heard girish there talking about the shifts that have happened already um, from a company standpoint what does that mean for how you operate but more importantly how you manage your employees Sure. Um but you know it, it's fascinating because again the title of our panel is you know beyond the world on edge is also how do you build this corporate resilience. And I think when we look at corporate resilience covid aside for a minute I think um the success and failure of business really depends on the sort of three circles. So first first and foremost is employees and again the pandemic demonstrated an entirely new way of looking and and connecting with employees and taking care of employees in in entirely new ways the second circle is the immediate community in which business operates and the broader one is for our society at large and you know we cannot be successful businesses in a failed world and to me you know there are many acts sort of early cor- cor- corporate acts during the pandemic early in the pandemic that really demonstrated commitment to that broader vision um and uh, early on mastercard was not the client of ours um announced this commitment uh, to join forces with Gates Foundation um and Wellcome Trust to form and, and make a significant investment in this set up called the, the the covid therapeutic accelerator mastercard was not a health tech company and so when andy banga was asked why they made that such enormous commitment uh, relative to the size of the business he said that they were in the business of um empowering um and, and unlocking economic possibilities and there are no possibilities if there is no economy and so um businesses today i think more than ever before need to have that broader vision and look at um their organizational strengths um and areas of business where they can play the most authentic role and most make the most authentic contribution i think starting first with uh, with employees and uh, thankfully i think we're seeing uh, a number of positive trends i don't know if you heard of the marshall plan for moms so we- the immediate business footprint um and uh, and sort of has a broader societal impact in mind um and this notion that uh, again wearing my hat I, i run our global partnerships team and so um where we actually help build those impact multiplying partnerships and so business needs to think across competitive lines and again there there is the silver line of the pandemic silver lining of the pandemic where we see pharma companies establish uh, you know previously unthinkable competitive partnerships on plasma treatments on vaccine distribution you see merk um distributing jays vaccine again something that I, i really hope that this is the positive out of covid where we redefine and how we look at partnerships who we partner with and um sort of remove some of those previously established bar- barriers yeah i think a lot of people were surprised at that that merk partnership but that certainly uh, is a perfect example of cross collaboration uh, palavi you want you want to add to that yes for sure um i'd say i'd look at it in three areas 
when I'm looking at resilience, I would say a uh, number one, it would be the resilience of countries and how they have to handle this. So we have to look at it as um, something that countries have to do a bit better uh, this time around. And I think we can just say that the authoritarian regimes did better than the, dem the democracies did. I think this was more related to just the trust uh, that had to be built between citizens and the government for the uh, to go through any major um, uh, you know upheaval uh, which is what we call this uh, pandemic and it, there may be more coming but i think at one level it has to be the countries and their citizens so so we have to build that trust that confidence between them and then it would be going to the company level and then we would say that the company's got to do better and i raised a few things saying you know you've got to build confidence, communicate with your customer, with your employees, mental health um, while you're dealing with this, um, flexibility that I pointed out, deploying technology, um, uh, pivoting. And we have these really nice stories that came out from, uh, you know, uh, there was this uh, business in Vermont um, that a, a, a restaurant that was asked to close down and um, because it did not have a patio and it collaborated with a neighboring business which was a bookstore and they used their patio and the bookstore said just put my books out where the patio is and we'll both do business so i think so those uh, collaborative moves i think uh, those would go towards resilience and staying um, strong in terms of the pandemic and the third point i'd make would be a collaboration between governments and companies. And I think uh, to point out, you know, there are many companies that have taken it on. Um, I think uh, smaller companies could contribute as well. But I think the larger organizations that in in itself, just by their revenues, work more like small countries, uh, play a large part in being able to uh, collaborate and come out and pivot and do all of those good things. So I would say that as a threefold um, uh, measure. Jagdish, you want to you want to jump in here? Uh, yeah, in fact, it, going back to the last of the two comments, uh, as a long-term business executive, I have said that being able to change has to be the DNA of the company. You're not going to have a lot of times the time window to be able to change over a long period of time. Pandemic has shown us that, as Paul Levy just mentioned, and as uh, you know previously mentioned, that people and businesses have to change on a time. That has to be part of the DNA. Large corporations have built processes and discipline around creating a longer term, stable environment. Mm -hmm. And I call that as a big ship trying to change. I think what we're seeing is with all the things that are happening, socioeconomically, global warming, aging of the population, technology implication, pandemic, business is going to have to change. And they're going to have to change very quickly and adapt. I think the whole pandemic has shown us how businesses, as uh, was mentioned, to create a remote work environment. Well, that creates, a, as, as uh, Girish mentioned, a team building challenge. Mm -hmm. well, it has to be part of the DNA, it has to be part of the training, that when you do the agile training, just make sure that it is part of the training that says, you don't have to be in the same room. Yeah. Um, uh, I love the future thought. All right, so all I was saying is that the as part of the resilience, resilience only comes from having a built-in DNA in the company to be able to address disruptions that's going to happen. So I think that, that that's a perfect segue to talk about a disruption that's already happening because um, climate change is, of course, the, the big... It's not even the big elephant in the room. It, it, it's the one that every company is trying to address right now. And, um, you know, if the lesson from this pandemic in many ways, and I, I heard you touch on the social safety net element, uh, certainly governments had a heavier hand. And those that did, did in fact, uh, were able to, to move much more quickly in response. And Francis, I wonder if I can put this question to you. As we look to, to governments potentially looking at collaborating on the issue of a lower carbon future, um, there's also this, this discussion that's happening about 
more and more regulation uh, that's likely to sort of force the hand of companies, uh, whether that is disclosures on emissions, whether that is um, looking at the, the overall footprint, uh, there's been talk of a carbon tax as well. I mean, how is Bell Helicopter looking at, at that part of the conversation? I know you're more involved in the technology side. Well, the climate is something that you have been looking at for a while. What do you, how are you looking at sort of these, these headwinds that are forming around this issue? Well, Ellen, honestly, and you said that, you know, the, the my job is technology. And yes, that is how we're looking to address some of these issues. You know, I I describe my job as I live five years in the future. I, I'm working on what, not what uh, helicopters look like today, but what they're going to look like five to 10 years from now. Uh, and I came out of, I was working on self-driving cars and, and other vehicles like that previously. And, um, you know, we were out there trying to figure out and, and very much so, uh, uh, the, the influence of climate change, the uh, dependence on fossil fuels, you know, it's kind of a dual part in that trying to reduce the carbon footprint. At the same time, we're trying to reduce our, our dependency on fossil fuels. Uh, there are a number of initiatives going on in the aviation business. One is on renewable aviation fuel um, or sustain, I guess we call it sustainable aviation fuel, SAF. Uh, working with other hydrocarbons that don't uh, are not are renewable resources, and then the the other enormous change, and we spent a huge amount of time on this, is the move to electric hybrid propulsion, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, specifically going to either an all electric system or one that runs off of the hydrogen fuel cells uh, that again gets us off the carbon footprint and gets us off of the fossil fuels. So those are everybody in the, I mean, when we meet in big industry groups, I belong to the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. That is a huge part of what we're doing. Um, we belong to a group called EPIC, which is the Electric Propulsion Innovation Committee. Kind of a cool name for it, but I mean, this, this is a big focus in the, in the, in the aviation world. And, and we know over the long term, we've got to do it. And it's just a question of how quickly we can move it along. And honestly, at this point, the industry is ahead of the government, and we want to stay that way. Um, but uh, even the met, when I've met with the FAA, uh, they have been very helpful and forward-looking and go, well, let's find a way to get this done. Let's find a way to make this happen. Yes, we've got regulation. Yes, we have to deal with the laws. That's, that's the world we live in. And we have to maintain the safety that we are you're used to seeing out of the aviation business, which is to say absolutely amazing safety. So putting that all together, uh, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but it's one that we're actually, honestly, everybody's really enjoying it. We can do stuff with electric propulsion we can't do with mechanical propulsion. And it's kind of exciting. You're seeing all, there's 80 new companies uh, around the world, I think currently producing some form of electronic, electric, vertical takeoff and landing vehicle, whereas before yeah. there were there were three. So uh, it's it's um, a whole new world out there, and we're quite excited about it. Yeah, and, and I just want to remind people who are uh, joining in on this panel that uh, we've got about 10 minutes here, so if you have any questions, feel free to put that in the chat. Um, Girish, let, you, know, you, you mentioned that, that the tech acceleration, the digital acceleration that's happened strictly with the pandemic, but we're now talking about uh, what could potentially be a much bigger crisis uh, in climate change? D is tech the accelerator? D does, does the digital adoption accelerate as the threat gets bigger? Or is tech part of the problem too? I mean, how, how do you look at that issue? Because while well, the pandemic is a year, climate change is a 20, 30 year problem. Yeah. No, so. Uh, from from uh, my from my vantage point, where what I see, um, I see that um, um, digital backbone is really at the center of what I call building resilience and adaptability. Okay. Uh, I call it what the digital spine. Okay. And if I look at organizations, enterprises, what they have realized during this particular crisis is that that um, the first part is providing connectivity to all all stakeholders. Okay. So I call it the four C thing. The first one is the connectivity piece. Okay. 
The second one, as soon as you provide connectivity to our employees and they are working in the safety of their home, the second one is how do you provide uh, sufficient collaboration mechanism? How do you get people to work together like, like we are all collaborating together right now? Okay. The third thing is if you need to, need to put collaboration in an organization, what people have realized is that you need to take all your assets and digitize it. And that is what where the cloud comes in. Okay. So mm-hmm. you need to take assets and put it on the cloud. And the far, fourth one, which people have realized is uh, very important, is uh, putting the cyber mechanism on top of it. Okay. So these are the four Cs, which is uh, connectivity, collaboration, cloud, and, and cyber. Okay. And I have seen organizations, uh, if you look at everybody, all the organizations in the world are essentially spending money on creating this particular digital spine. Okay. Now, if I look at it from a from a um, outside in point of view, um, you will see that almost all the I mean, our own consumers, whoever the, the youngsters, the Gen Zs who are coming in, they all have a, uh, they all want to buy products which are more sustainable. They want to buy products from organizations who have a strong purpose, who have a strong intent. And uh, what we are going to see is that uh, we are going to see a lot more focus in the area of sustainability, of sustainable mm-hmm. being developed, sustainable solutions being mm-hmm. developed. Is not only just because our consumers demand it, but we've also realized that the last three industrial revolution has created a lot of economic activity. But at the end of it, we've also degraded the the, the global arena quite a bit. Can we? These are we can bring this together. So I believe technology has a has a lot of interesting solutions, like in the area of aging or like in the area of urbanization. I'll give you a simple example. I mean, today three billion people in the world live in, in cities. If we continue this particular path, we will add another another a billion more people to come to cities by 2030. Okay. Probably what this crisis has taught us is we don't need everybody to come and clutter in cities. We can still do the same thing, but live in villages and they can still continue to do the same thing. So, I mean, technology can provide some solutions in, in some of these areas. So, I mean, yeah. think of the four things, purpose, trust, which, uh, uh, which we spoke about. The third one is digitization. And the fourth one, we're getting strong towards sustainability. You know, this panel, we've never disagreed, so I'm going to kind of throw uh, an oddball at the duration. Technology is both an enabler and it's going to be a challenge going forward. Technology yeah. will eliminate an awful lot of jobs. It'll create a, a skill gap. And that's going to create a whole set of population that we will have to think about as to how do we then employ them? How do we keep them economically stable? So technology is both uh, an enabler and to me, it's a threat. But in the resilient world, we have to think about as to what are we gonna do when technology eliminates the low end jobs who don't have the skills yeah. and will create so- well, and, and I think that, you know, t- to your point, is technology being sort of a positive and a negative on the issue of climate? Many would argue you're putting all the information in the cloud. I mean, that's a lot of energy that's being consumed. And of course, that's part of the development of the technology as well. We've only got a few minutes left here, and I'd love to do sort of one last round with all of our panelists. Um, we, we've talked a lot in very broad themes here um, about building resilience. And yet, I have to say, I'm not entirely convinced that this resilience building is necessarily going to lead to a much more collaborative environment, just given the geopolitical tensions we're seeing right now. So I wonder in the last few minutes if we can go around to talk about what you see as the the biggest risk right now to that plan that you have set forward that businesses should adopt and trying to be much more resilient coming out of this pandemic. Um, Girish, let's start with you. What, what do you see as the biggest risk? No, I think the, uh, the biggest risk is we not being able to uh, understand the, the new generation of people coming in, their aspirations mm-hmm. and, and building products or, or services which cater to their aspirations. And that I think is you know, if we, if we we, we continue in the same way as what we were we were doing before. Then I then I think we are we are going to be hitting a wall very soon. So we all need to continuously evolve and adapt. Anna, 
Um, I think uh, probably uh, geogra- geo-nationalism uh, as, a, as a broader trend. And I think especially in the recovery phase, so many countries and sometimes companies aligning with sort of the, the national vision tend to country first not just America first, but in many instances, many other countries first initiative. And I think it's uh, something that we need to, as globalists in nature, uh, we need to um, uh, not accept. Follow me. I think we're reflective uh, in times uh, that are tough, but we're like elastic. We just go back to the same position that we were in the past. And I think it's a short memory that I'm worried about that we will forget and we will go back to our old ways and we will do what we are saying we won't do. So that's my worry. Jagdish, I see you nodding your head. Yeah, I had an opportunity to speak with a, uh, a very high-level executive insurance.